evening. My name is Grace Hayek, and on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library, I welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, which is titled Seizing Your Moment, Finding Meaning and Purpose in Changemaking. Now, I'd like to introduce Steve Pfeiffer, whose book, The Moment, Changemakers on Why and How They Joined the Fight for Social Justice, sparked this event. He will then introduce tonight's moderator, Howard Rossman, and our three panelists, Don Katz, Clarissa Martinez de Castro, and Michael Stoutmanis. Steve Pfeiffer, who grew up in Glencoe, is a New York Times bestselling author of 20 books. His latest book, The Moment, was published in November 2022 and is an oral history from today's social justice activists, three of whom are tonight's panelists. Steve recently collaborated with civil rights icon, Dr. C.T. Vivian on his memoir, It's in the Action, Memories of a Nonviolent Warrior. He also collaborated with Southern Poverty Law Center co-founder Morris Dees on two award-winning memoirs. He's the co-author of Jimmy Lee and James, Two Lives, Two Deaths, and the Movement that Changed America, and with his wife wrote 50 Ways to Help Your Community. A graduate of Yale and the University of Chicago Law School, he was the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. He currently serves on the advisory board of the Chicago-based Civic Leadership Foundation. Steve, it's really been a pleasure working with you to make this program happen, and now I will hand the reins over to you. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, I, I'm dating myself, but my ties with the Glencoe Public Library go all the way back to the 1950s. And uh, I still remember the name of the uh, children's librarian, Mrs. Jacobs, and have fond memories of, of being here. And I'm especially happy to be here with such a distinguished group of people, including two old friends, from Glencoe who went on to great things after they got their library cards at the library. Don't know if that's a uh, cause and effect, but uh, they've really done terrific things. Don Katz, one of the change makers who's featured in the book and you'll be meeting in just a little while. And Howard Rossman, uh, my good friend who will be moderating tonight. Uh, through Howard's moderation and through Don and Clarissa and Mike, uh, you'll be learning a little about the book, The Moment, and you'll be learning about their personal journeys that led for them to fight for social justice and why that fight is of such value, not just to them and the community, but to all of us. So uh, before turning the reins over to Howard, I'm going to introduce each one of them to you. Start with Mike. Mike Straubmanis is a native Chicagoan, a graduate of the University of Illinois and the University of Illinois Law School. He's currently the Executive Vice President for External Affairs at the Obama Foundation. Prior to that, he was a counselor to President Obama and Chief of Staff to presidential advisor, Valerie Jarrett. Clarissa Martinez de Castro is the vice president of the Latino Vote Initiative at Unidos US, which is the largest national Latino civil rights and advocacy organization in the US. There, she oversees efforts to advance an accurate understanding of Hispanic voters and their priorities and to expand civic engagement by advancing a participation continuum that helps immigrants become citizens, citizens become voters, and the community overall become an active participant in policy debates. She also designed Rise Above, which is a pilot initiative to build a positive, accurate narrative of our changing America that fosters collaborative action. She's a naturalized U.S. citizen who was born and raised in Mexico. Now, Don Katz, a fellow South Schooler, who went on from Glencoe to NYU, the London School of Economics, and then a really distinguished 20-year career as an award-winning journalist and author of several books, Globetrotter for Rolling Stone and other publications. Then in 1995, he had a great idea and founded audible.com, 
And since then, he's led this Newark-based company from that idea to becoming a global media serving tens of millions of listeners each day. Moreover, in my opinion, Audible's the foster child for good corporate citizenship and corporate responsibility. And Don, the force behind that, has been recognized as one of America's top 25 disruptive leaders for his work on behalf of urban transformation in Newark by living cities. I should note, as Grace pointed out, that there's an audible version of the moment, and Don actually reads his chapter in the uh, in the audible version, and he does a great job, which is no surprise. Finally, Howard Rossman, our moderator, is the founder and board president of the Civic Leadership Foundation, which is an educational nonprofit headquartered here in Chicago. CLF helps middle school students develop social emotional skills and use those skills to improve lives in their school and community. Prior to founding CLF, Howard spent his career in investment management and was the vice president of Mesro Financial Holdings and the founder of Mesro Advanced Strategies, Inc., which became one of the largest fund of hedge funds in the world. He's been a dear friend since Central School, and I'm delighted to turn the reins over to him to moderate. So take it away, Howard. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> I had to find the uh, uh, unmute button. Um, a wonderful thing to actually be able to gather everybody together here. And uh, for those of you who have, read the the moment uh, you'll recognize uh, the panelists as uh, three exemplars of the uh, amazing stories that uh, that are told in this book um and to that end steve i'd like to start with you if, if i could and just so could you tell us a little bit about why you decided to write this book um and especially why you decided it was important now sure uh as Grace uh, mentioned when uh, saying a little about me, uh, I had the honor a few uh, years ago of beginning to work with uh, the late Dr. C.T. Vivian on his memoir. I'd, I'd come across uh, Dr. Vivian uh, while doing research for uh, my 2015 book, Jimmy Lee and James, which was uh, focused on the a uh, struggle for a Voting Rights Act uh, centered in, in Selma and other cities in Alabama, and he was integral to that uh, movement. And uh, we became uh, phone friends based on our uh, conversations while I was doing that research, and that led to our collaborating on uh, his memoir about his 70 years as a social justice activist many of which were spent at the side of Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, he wanted to call that book, and his family was insistent after his passing that we call that book, It's in the Action, because that was his mantra. And after he uh, passed away, his daughter Denise sent me a copy of one of the uh, sermons that Dr. Vivian had, had given, and in the margins, he had written several times, it's in the action, it's in the action. And I realized that even though uh, this civil rights icon was called the greatest preacher uh, ever by Dr. King and was a collector of 6,000 volumes of, of books uh, dating back to colonial times, dealing with African-American literature and African-American nonfiction, that he was a man of action and that's what was needed to really effect change. And so that led me to go on a search for people who were actually in the fight for social justice and doing important things. And, and you ask, uh, why was that the right time? Well, it was early 2021, shortly after the insurrection, shortly after uh, several, you know, 
terrible years of, of government in, uh, in the United States uh, during COVID times. And I just felt this was the right time to, uh, to pursue this book, Howard. And um, to sort of follow on on that, um, and you, you know, how did you choose the people that you decided were that you wanted to interview for this for the for the book? Well, I knew I wanted a, a wide range of people, some of whom were kind of professionals who were in the fight for social justice on a, on a full time basis. Uh, like Clarissa, you know, working uh, for a large organization, or Mike, who uh, had been in government and now is at the Obama Foundation, and uh, and someone in the corporate world, and I and I knew Don, and I I knew the wonderful things he had been doing. So, but I also wanted uh, people who just in the in the course of their everyday lives had somehow integrated the fight for social justice into uh, their professional or in some cases student life uh, as architects, as lawyers, as doctors, teachers, etc. And I wanted a wide range of people in terms of their their backgrounds, their ages, uh, their ethnicities and and so forth. And so, that set me off on a search uh, through, you know, just using my journalistic instincts to try and find the the right people for uh, for the book. I, I was fortunate enough to know Mike, to know Don, uh, gotten to know Clarissa, which has been a pleasure, and uh, just go out searching uh, people. So that led me to people like the youngest person in the book, Carolyn Considine, who's a uh, senior now in in high school but two or three years ago uh, after the uh, murder of George Floyd was uh moved to do something in in her school and started uh using art and the creation of murals to uh to spark a discussion about what social justice is and that's led to a program like that in schools across the country and I just kept looking and, and sometimes going down rabbit holes uh, until I found a, a great mix of, of people uh, who were willing to participate in this venture. Yeah, that's great. And there are some incredible stories in the book for those of you who uh, have, haven't read it yet. Um, so to the panel, I love that you guys are all accomplished and, and busy um, uh, changing the world changing your worlds. Um, so I'd love to understand a little bit about what is it that drew you to this project? Um, and what did you think was possible to accomplish in doing that? And Clarissa, I'll start with you. Well, you know, I, I um, one of the things I have to say is that um, I am surprised to be part of this group when I look at everybody that is part of this amazing um, set of stories and journeys that Steve wrote about. Um, so first of all, I want to start thanking Steve and of course, Glenco Library for giving us this space and Howard for moderating this. Um, I think it really if anything, I think part of my story is more about how you don't have to plan for it. Sometimes it's just about stepping up when there's an opportunity and trying things and asking questions and trying to figure out why things are the way they are at the same time that you are trying to navigate through those things. Um, you know, to be honest, I never thought I find myself where I am right now. Um, my life has taken a lot of twists and turns. And it's one of the reasons when Steve and I were talking about it, and he asked, what was the moment, right? I said, in my case, the moment was a long one. And it, it was more the result of a lot of different experiences. Um, that eventually take you in a particular way. 
Um, so if anything, I want to share that so that folks out there who may, like I did at times, think that in order to have any of the positions you see around here that you set out on that course years back, uh, that that's not always the case. Hmm. It's interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask you in a, a minute about some of the one of the lines you wrote you 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 shared in that book about um, being an accidental advocate. Well, um, but in the meantime, um, Mike, how about for you? What what was it that called you to this uh, book, and and what did you what did you hope that we could accomplish in in this? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm in Oak Park, which is uh, uh, a little bit on the other side of the city from Glencoe, but but close enough. Um, I'd say that, uh, well, first Steve called me. Um, and so it was, uh, it was a person, not a what. And, and I, and I say that because, you know, I've really, um, over time started to build my, uh, express explicitly build my life around relationships. And, um, and I learned that path the hard way, frankly, that, you know, um, there are people who you bet on uh, rather than um, other things that you might think might be the right way to pursue uh, pursue, a, pursue a certain course of action. And, and I guess my, and I similarly, I was pretty um, surprised to be asked once I heard about what the cause was. And I knew Steve had just worked on a book about um, Reverend C.T. Vivian. Um, and, I, and I thought that, um, it was an opportunity to share um, a bit behind the scenes um, around how uh, the pathway to creating change. I think that um, most of the history books that I read when I was, you know, sort of wanting to get involved in politics or hoping maybe, you know, I just would learn about the presidency. Um, it, it seemed like a bit of a straight line, you know, to from one action to a result. And uh, and that always made me feel like I was doing something wrong because <laughs> it never felt like a straight line to me in the time and the moment. And so I thought I would, I thought that, you know, in sharing, I could share a little bit about um, how, you know, sometimes stories and history is told in a way that makes things feel elegant and natural. And, you know, and then you, you build these steps along the way. Um, and instead that it's a lot of uh, happenstance and failure um, and fortune. Um, uh, and that, um, and that I agree with you so much, Clarissa, that gave me that realization as I started to figure that out, it gave me the sense that there was a place for me in the work. Um, and my hope is that it gives others the sense that there's a place for them, um, in the work, uh, as messy as we all can be. Mm. Here, here. Yeah. Yeah. A place for all of us in this, in this work. Um, and Don, how about for you, you know, what drew you to this, um, what, what were you hoping, were you thinking that might be, we'd be able to accomplish in this, in this work? You know, I, I think I, my first reaction was that I'm not, uh, worthy given people who have a, a full-time dedication to, uh, to activism. And as in my first 20 year career as a writer, I got to get up close to, terrorists and revolutionaries and, uh, and people who are willing to die for causes, um, you know, in an instant. So uh, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of a, a decorated World War II hero uh, from Chicago. And I, I just, uh, I, I thought it through. And then the truth of the matter is, I think I was most um, interested in jumping in because I was guessing that there would probably be a lot of other people who had started companies. Um, who define themselves by, by social justice pursuits. And that um, the truth is social responsibility has become pretty much a throwaway line um, for most American corporations. It's, uh, it's basically sending checks in from afar uh, to nonprofits with the hope that, um, and probably the understanding that the, you know, the kind of um, 
you know, operational efficacy that uh, that got them the money to give away is maybe not necessarily exhibited in, in these. But it's a very distant arms length expiation of, of guilt. And it does hark back to um, Martin Luther King, 1963, just talking about charity as being fine, but it can also mask the root causes of the need for charity. So it is true that when Audible, I kind of knew because of my formation in the 60s in Chicago, which I talk about in the book and all the influences that, um, that, that changed me, um, that even as that well, I knew that when Audible became successful, we wouldn't be that company. So what we did is move to a, a, a historically challenged black and brown city um, and, and did it in a way to, uh, to basically not um, to try to create programmatic concepts that were scalable and transferable and potentially fundable from the three sectors that tend to fund society with one or another, the, you know, the government, uh, the private sector and the, and the philanthropic sector. Um, and we developed a lot of programs that, that really did make a lot of change and certainly made Audible a better company. And we imbued actually the corporate principles with um, urban inequality and um, as a stated purpose. And uh, when we talk about caring, it's activate Karen, and it's actually to, uh, you know, to be, to be, you know, there on the ground. And, and I've got to tell you, it's not a trend that corporations are moving into challenged cities. You might move to a neighborhood because of cost, which is not what we did. We didn't need to move, but we just decided this was going to be an indelible part of what the company means. And it's been incredibly, you know, gratifying and frustrating. Um, as, I, as I know, the experts uh, on the panel of me would, would, would understand. You know, staying with you for a moment, can you talk a little bit more about what that frustration has been and what you, how the company reacted to this move from, I think you were outside of the, uh, Newark and you actually moved the company right into uh, to Newark? Yeah, well, the frustrations were never with the people who, who worked at Audible and, and the consultants told us that we'd lose a huge percentage of our people by moving to a city considered dangerous and uh, and obviously, um, and kind of forgot, and uh, and that was simply not the case. We didn't lose anybody, and um, and the idea of of taking up mission. The first thing we did is basically to no more nepotistic paid internships um, from all the you know our friends, uh, and everybody had to be kid from New York or educated in New York, and this just created a, um, a such an amazing impact in the quality of people that came into our world. They started graduating from high schools and we made them Audible scholars. We then started developing uh, programs that, that speak to the fact that even the K-12 scholars coming from the urban core, from the, some of the amazing schools, um, you, there was a real issue with the vocabulary of the workplace, not being in the sonic background of if you grew up in, in these environments. So we began to create almost curricularized um, ways to to imbue that that spirit of how corporations and companies talk. Um, so that would be you know just an example. We decided to, to try to employ the least employable people on paper in the city, which is usually people without degrees. So we ended up try, having people come into tech jobs who were previously without homes, most uh, out of prison, and and other um, other kind of kind of backgrounds and. Uh, uh, and it, it just raised the, the culture um, in, in really profound ways. And, uh, you know, so everything we kind of did was designed to basically, you know, be at sort of root cause levels and scalable. Um, start a venture fund that, that was to bring other companies. And part of that is to stop the cycle of the successes from, from the urban core elite. Um, and that robs the cities of, of the intellectual capital that they need to stop some of the generational things that are you know, unconscionable. So basically, uh, the idea was to you know, draw the talent back, um, and that was quite successful. When COVID hit, uh, we started Newark Working Kitchens as a crisis response startup. And it was because the liberal go-to move is the food pantry. But in a place like Detroit or Newark, you can't, <laughs> food pantries do not work. We know there's a long list of reasons. They're big, nobody has cars, everybody had COVID, there are comorbidities in the environments when people can't go out and shouldn't go out. So we basically just went to 37 
local restaurants, which were very much where the working poor were, you know, at risk during COVID, um, and basically said, we're going to buy 200 meals a day uh, for you from $10 a piece. And our trucks that we aren't using, we're going to deliver them to people who shouldn't go out and can't go out and it retained hundreds and hundreds of jobs of people you know, from Newark. So it's just the kind of stuff that some, not everything has certainly worked, but, um, but we've tried, you know, to do, I mean, we do, <laughs> we pay our employees $500 a month after taxes if for rent to fill if they move to Newark. And it, the data shows that it creates a, a flywheel of, um, of economic investment and return that is, uh, has exponents on the return side, including, you know, employment. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not, uh, dying for a cause <laughs> and it's uh and it's not full-time activism which is why i was kind of you know a little bit a little bit reticent at first but when i you know i sort of saw how steve drew out the story um and what it looked like particularly my you know my experience of chicago in the 60s and uh which was you know intensely formative um i thought it ended up being a pretty good thing and it has to inspire other people other people who run companies to sort of say what can I do that's just more than giving a dollar away? Um, so I think that's an incredible action. Uh, Clarissa, turning to you for a moment, um, you mentioned, as I said, that in your, in your story that um, for you, it was you sort of came on this social activism accidentally. You said, I think you said, and I'm an, became an accidental advocate, which by the way, I love that frame. I love that phrase. Can you tell us a little bit about A, how that accident occurred and how you recognized um, those choices that you were making along the way? Sure. I mean, the, the interesting thing is that and, and I love how Michael was talking about that, you know, there's a, an, ele an elegant way in which stories get written and it seems linear or like there's a progression. Uh, and in some ways, if if you do that with the different experiences I've had, you could say, oh, you know, it it seems like a progression of things. But the reality is that I am not a planner. Um, I mean, those folks who know what they want to be when they grow up and they set on that path to pursue it. I so admire that because I am not that. Um, what I mean accidental is, so if you think about, um, you know, a teenager undocumented coming to a new country, a new language, a new society, and just trying to navigate that um and then you know th th when I finally got the opportunity to go to college I was a I was a microbiology major um something I I changed it like three times right I have to say that since being in Mexico I do remember my mom and my dad who didn't finish high school would still, you know, sit around the table talking about what was happening with the politics in Mexico and corruption and all of that. So that certainly stays with you. And once I realized that, unfortunately, I realized it only after I had made it through, bio, through organic chemistry, <laughs> that probably microbiology was not going to be my, the thing that rocked my world. At that point, um, I just decided to try things that came along the way and sometimes many a times not by people around me who knew better than I did, uh, since I didn't really know how things worked. And I, so accidental in particular also has to do with being very lucky, lucky about being at the right place, um, near the right people who didn't have to care or didn't have to intervene, but, but, but they did. And I think the lasting thing for me as a result of that, and also seeing how immigration and the lack of a functional immigration system that America can be proud of has impacted not only the Latino community, my own family, but the country as a whole that my path was so much shaped by luck, being around good people that decided to 
steer me in a certain way and help me in a certain way. And it really made me realize that um, it is tragic that luck would be such a huge determinant of what happens in your life and that that shouldn't be the case that there are so many people out there that are so deserving that have such immense potential potential we would all benefit greatly if unleashed but that luck shouldn't determine that and so i think that that's one of the things that moves me about the work i do uh, whether it is fighting for better immigration laws or for greater access to the voting booth so that the great diversity of our country, those aspirations can be heard, is that I think together we can work to ensure that luck is not the biggest determinant of what happens with each one of us. Hmm. Howard, can I, can I interject here for a second? Yeah, of course. Um, hearing both Don talk about his activism and Clarissa talk about uh, her activism and their their goals and and achievements, uh, it, it's wonderful and and that's a really important part of of the book. And so too are 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 their personal journeys, uh, like. Don hinted to you know growing up in Chicago during uh, during the '60s and and how intense that was for him and Clarissa you talked about uh, a little of the the luck and some of the people who came in contact with you and and just you know for the audience here could you talk just for a second about the like the the your choice between going into ROTC or gym <laughs> class. And then the the mentor that you you had in ROTC of all places that figure into that kind of lucky narrative. Absolutely, I think that is the the greatest example of happenstance, happenstance, serendipity, luck, whatever you may want to call it. So when I first came to the states, my um, my image of what high school in the United States was was from movies I've seen, right, uh, growing up. And many of those movies had locker scenes with kids naked. And I was not going to do that. <laughs> that, was, I, that was not my thing, right? I'm like, I am not going to get naked in school. Uh, I didn't even wear shorts. I was like really shy. So when I went to register, um, there were students staffing registration. The, the high school I went to in East LA is gigantormous. Um, so they were there were students volunteering with the registration process. Anyway, so I get there and school is also completely different from what I'd been in Mexico. So they tell me I need to sign up for these classes and PE, physical education is a requirement. So I need to sign up for that. And I said, no, thanks. I don't want that. Uh, something else. And they said, well, there's this other R class ROTC, which also um, fulfills that requirement. And I said, what's ROTC? And the students are like, I don't know. And I said, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> but the great lucky thing is that the two army sergeants that were running the ROTC program found themselves. I don't know how we ended up there. I didn't ask uh, the other uh, students who were also immigrants like me and didn't speak speak English, if they ended up there the same way I did. Um, but the sergeants found themselves with a handful of students who didn't speak English, and they took it upon themselves to tutor us. We would stay after class. Anybody who's on our ROTC knows that you practice before school, during lunch, and after class. So we would stay after classes were done and they would tutor us in English. And um, because in ROTC, you also have to learn map reading and do presentations. And we were working very closely. Um, it was a very tight knit family. They pushed me really hard. And it is thanks to them that my English got better a lot faster and I started speaking it a lot faster. So if my life had taken just the slightest different of a turn, um, 
I would be in the military right now. Mm. Well, I think and all- I could still be an advocate in the military. That's another thing. I don't need you don't need to be for a, working for a civil rights organization to be an advocate uh, or fight for social justice. You can do it from business and from a number of other chairs. That's great. You never know where that opportunity or that inspiration will come from. I think that's one of the purposes. And Stephen, you write in the book is that is creating that opportunity for inspiration. So Mike, and ter- could you tell us a little bit about your story and um, and what is it that, um, what were those def- sort of defining moments that helped you sort of realize what it is that you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I do. Um, it really does resonate that, um, you know, you see in unfairness. Um, and I, I think the the interesting thing for me is that as I grew up, I saw people with just as much or more talent, just as much a, a more work ethic. Um, and and I saw my mother and other people take these extraordinary efforts to give me opportunity and to change my circumstances. And it just strike, struck me as unfair. And then I, you know, one of the interesting things that um, have, has happened over the years is as I've spent a lot of time in more, I'd say, elite circles, um, I meet a bunch of people who really in their heart believe that they're in a meritocracy and that everything that they achieved is because of their own skill and greatness. And that that gap between what my lived experience has been and the and the world that I think people want to um, see themselves is because I want to see myself as having achieved, you know, ever earned everything that I have. Um, <clears throat> but I've just seen the uh, the unfairness and the lack of opportunity that's structural. And so it's really those experiences that um, spurred me on first, I think, to really um, understand it because it was confusing to me. It didn't it didn't fit um, with, um, you know, what I was taught about, you know, the American dream, what I had seen um, in different settings and environments as, as I participated. So I was trying to figure out what was going on, why the why the structures were the way they were. Um, and so that led me to law school. Um, that led me, um, you know, into uh, activism, much more around sort of grassroots politics. Um, it was also, frankly, opportunity and and a real drive and desire to sort of not get pulled down by, um, you know, what I felt were a bunch of circumstances that were that were stacked out there. Um, you know, I. I experienced whether it was in school or whether it was with police or whether it was, um, you know, kind of walking around, being around Chicago, the fact that people thought I was dangerous because I was a tall, loud black guy. Um, I saw that um, there were a set of expectations that people had of me, um, both that in some respects that were really um, lower than what I thought I could achieve. My mother in particular told me that I could be and achieve. But then also just a sense of uh, pressure um, that people had made sacrifices for me and it was my responsibility uh, to live up to them. And so there's a little bit of desperation that if I didn't take advantage of the opportunities that were in front of me, you know, I was going to fail. I was going to, you know, be um, poor that I was gonna have to do the kinds of jobs that I saw you know, my grandparents doing or, or my parents or, or aunts and uncles doing, um, filled with a lot of um, uh, you know, being insulted, being um, disrespected, not able to live up to their own potential. Um, I was sort of desperate to um, get myself out of those circumstances. So that motivated me as well. And then the last thing is, you know, and I, I'll just tell this story, um, and try to make, I'll try to do the short version of it, uh, because it, 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 com- it sort of demonstrates both the level of ambition and desperation that I had 
uh, and good fortune and how much mentors, Clarissa, can do for you. So I had, uh, I started working as a bike messenger in college, mostly because it was the job that I found that could give me the most cash. Um, uh, mo primarily because I was uh, dating someone who now is my wife and uh, I was trying to impress her all the time and it's terrible money anyway. Um, so I was spending it as soon as I could get it. And uh, and I was interested in going to law school. I was, uh, I just kind of gotten out of the theater program uh, same thing, you know, uh, you realized you weren't going to end up being in science. I ended up, there were people better than me. Uh, so I wasn't going to make a career um, in the arts. And so uh, I found that there were, uh, talked my way into a job at a law firm as a messenger and found out that there were these law students who were getting paid uh, the same amount as a first year lawyer for the summer which was more money than I could ever even contemplate getting. Um, decided I needed to get a job at one of these law firms the next summer, found some poor woman uh, at uh, head of a HR firm who gave, made the mistake of giving me her card when I sh showed up to deliver packages. Uh, and I called her every month for 13 months looking for a job the next summer. Um, she would, after a while, she would never call me back. She would never answer my call. I'd just leave voicemail messages saying, hey, I was just checking in, looking for this role. And in the middle of the next summer, while well, I was selling um, clothes at a uh, structure, which used to be, we're all of, this, of the age, there was like limited express and structure on Michigan Avenue. I was selling clothes on Michigan Avenue. Another job that gave me a lot of cash because I get paid on commission. And uh, and I got a call saying that I could come in and work as a project assistant in this law firm for a, a month and a half for the rest of the summer. And I met a really talented young lawyer there who had an eye out and was looking at me as someone who she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. That was Michelle Robinson, who married this hotshot young lawyer named Barack Obama. Um, and 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 it was that relationship that ended up spurring me on to understand that there were, um, that I could really take the ideas that I had about making the world a better place and put them into action. Um, and that actually, you know, I like to get paid to do that. Um, so it was, it was, it was really those set of circumstances that pulled me into um, trying to make a difference in the world um, as a, as a, as a job, as a vocation. Um, and I couldn't imagine that that was even possible sitting where I sat, you know, in my mother's home, even though she was a school teacher, really well educated. That was just a circumstance that I uh, that was very far away from uh, very far away from me. Um, and it, it was that kind of mix that pulled me in that direction. Mm. Mike, mm. did you have to overcome a certain suspicion of of government to kind of go on the path that you were on based on your personal experiences? Yeah, you know, actually, Steve, I thought government was where the stuff was that people needed to get. So I wasn't suspicious of it. I was more, um, frankly, uh, and, and, and in the world that I ended up falling into um, with my interest in politics, uh, I, I I got in contact with the sort of structure of politics in the city. And one of the things that's really interesting about Chicago is Chicago um, has been uh, the place, I believe, that has the longest continually, uh, a congressional district that has been um, represented by uh, a, a Black person for the longest continuing period of time in, in the nation's history. And, and part of the structure of Chicago politics was to give um, certain groups kind of a piece of the pie and give them an opportunity to participate in the system and kind of go, but never go kind of too far, only go too far, so far. And so walking into that, I actually saw that um, there was a place for government to work um, and that uh, and that you could impact it through po through politics. 
and and that gave me the idea that if I if I participated in it um, and was able to somehow drive it in a particular direction, that it could make a, a a profound change. I didn't get cynical about government until like I don't know re-election of Barack Obama in 2012. Uh, I was I was. <laughs> I, I well, what I did was I saw the limits of what we could accomplish. Um, uh, at, you know, I'd sort of looked. I kind of was at the mount at a mountain. I was on a mountaintop, and I looked around. And I was like, okay, I think I I think I pulled all the levers I can pull here, mm -hmm. um, and we're still not able to um, you know accomplish everything we're looking to accomplish. What did I learn? Where else could I go um, to make a difference? Learning what I know now. Boy, that's, that's, that's great, Mark. I, you know, so, uh, you know, we, we met um, at a, I, I had, a, I had a, some fascinating experiences, not related to Chicago, including being mentored by Ralph Ellison, who really cared about what was going to happen to me. And we actually met at, a, at Symphony Hall at a ode to Ralph, that I, what I call jazz in the key of Ellison, who went to Marcellus. But, um, but I just, you know, I was just thinking about this because, I, I mean, Stephen Howard and I come from a part of, the Chicago world that was not um, challenged. And uh, I came from um, a background in Chicago where my, my great grandmother and my grandmother both worked at Hull House. And um, my grandmother, the, one of the first women to get a social work degree from the University of Chicago. And my, my grandfather and my mother's side was really close with Harold Washington and very much uh, um, you know, a Chicago liberal kind of driver. I, I was pretty much radicalized more than I was liberalized by my experience of, of Chicago growing up. Um, I looked up to uh, Fred Hampton and I got to go down and to the south side with breakfast and, you know, state, the Chicago authorities uh, murdered him. And, um, you know, I, I was very much, uh, in fact, I, I went to work in, to volunteering the Cabrini Green Homes, which if anybody ever knew what those were like, the warehousing of human beings was unconscionable, and it just it, it, I couldn't I just couldn't believe it. Um, then there was you know the, the the it was it didn't take much, and you know in the day, the only place along the North Shore that any of the black people lived was a part of Glencoe, and one of my best friends and I, and we used to get pulled over on Sheridan Road just because he was in the car, and uh, you know it was um, it, it didn't take much in those days to. Uh, to, to come away from that, to say nothing of an immoral war in Asia, um, in, South, in Southeast Asia. So, I, you know, it was, uh, it was quite a time. And obviously the, the conspiracy trial and being, you know, active during, during that and what went on in Grant Park. I mean, those were the coming age of age experiences for me. And I think what happened with me, though, is I wanted to tell the truth about it. And that's where, if you work with Rolling Stone in the early days, like I did, you know, that was about telling the truth because the New York Times didn't. And, you know, interesting historical revisionism, you know, the Watergate happened way after. <laughs> I mean, the I mean, the Pentagon Papers happened way after uh, they were, you know, refusing to even use the word black about six years after the, the Olympics when, you know, it was being being asked for and they, they weren't against the Vietnam War. So, so you know, I, I had that kind of experience growing up and it was, um, it was intense in Chicago if you were sentient and, and aware of what was going on. And of course, the weird thing was most of the kids in Glen Cold Nest weren't. <laughs> so I, I just thought, you know, this was something. But so, you know, I, I kind of went off on my, you know, my, my, you know, my path. But boy, Chicago was quite a place to learn. And, you know, when I, <laughs> when I get to New Jersey, um, first of all, What's really interesting in Newark is that the the employer of last resort is the nonprofit sector in Newark. It's a massive webwork of, of nonprofit employment. Um, in the city, it, it, when I grew up, it was the government last resort. And it was a very powerful means of, of political <laughs> political control and political action. But I'll never forget explaining over and over again that I'm my politics are the politics of getting shit done because you know, in a democratic state, I said, I grew up in a democratic city where the Democrats were not the good guys. And uh, okay. it kind of <laughs> it was quite, it was uh, the truth at that point. Um, 
I want to interrupt for a second. If people have questions, we're not going to, uh, we'll take questions through. The, there's a Q&A button at the bottom, just put it in there. And in a couple of minutes, we'll start to get questions. But sort of in a, as a wrap up, I'd love to get each of your, and Steve, you, you as well in this, your, your thoughts about um, someone listening to this um, uh, webinar gets inspired by, you know, your stories. Um, reads the book, gets more inspired by the opportunities that created, you know, what advice or recommendations do you think, you know, given your experience that you would give them? Steve, I'll start with you. Uh, resilience, uh, patience, and most of all, I would say using whatever skills you have to try and work in, at least initially, in uh, a sphere uh, where those skills can be utilized and finding others with the skills that you might not possess to, uh, to help you effect change and, uh, I think you know we titled uh, this program "Finding uh, Meaning and and Purpose," and I, I just want to reemphasize the fact that uh, that when you embark on journeys like you know the the three other folks up on the screen have embarked upon, that there I I I don't want to speak for them, but I, but I know the studies show, and I think from talking to the people in doing in doing the book that uh, you're not only you know making a difference with the uh, community you're you're finding meaning and purpose in in your own life and and that's 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 healthy. Clarissa, what's, what about for you? What, what what advice would you give you know somebody who's just sort of got inspired, but thinking about what the next step might be. I would say, um, I mean, just hearing the stories here, let alone all the stories in the book that I hope people, uh, what they take away is that there's no predetermined path. It's not supposed to look a certain way. You are not supposed to be a certain kind of person. Um, it's just you, you know, like to use that trite phrase, uh, that, that trite phrase, uh, see something, say something. Uh, and in my case, the most important thing, do something. Um, it could be something that impacts one person that is in your vicinity, uh, your neighbor, somebody in your family. It could be something that impacts hundreds or thousands. But I think we all have an opportunity to create, to, to be advocates and to create change every day. Um, it can be a tiring thing. And, and I think that uh, Michael alluded to, to this is that the people you are in community with um, that are around you and support you or are in the trenches with you doing this work or doing what you set out to do are the folks that will be there when you need to be picked up, uh, when you're feeling down, or when you need to offer that support to somebody else. And that community is incredible. I think for me, the motivation is because of all these you know, original strangers I came across who helped me along the way, part of the motivation is the need to pay it back and to pay it forward so that it is absolutely true that you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but it's also absolutely true that in order to do that, you need to have boots and boots with straps, right? So working to make sure that people have the boots and the straps to pull themselves up by the bootstraps um, is part of what keeps me going. And we can all do that in many different ways. Well, thanks, Chris. Chris, I have to say, I loved what you wrote about uh, activism was putting care and hope into action. Because 
you didn't say it's putting rage um, into action. You know, you put it in a way that clearly it speaks to your your presence and the fact that you've been. I, you, you and I have both have twenty seven years. Audible's twenty seven years all since I started it, and uh, I think that's you've been doing it too. But I was really kind of kind of touched by that because the truth of the matter is that if you go at high purpose experiences, you know, building a big company from an idea or, you know, setting yourself up, it, it, it can be quite frustrating. I mean, it is, you know, you do have to fight through. Um, and then, you know, the disappointments around, you, I mean, the, the character of, you know, just it's, it's pretty, pretty constant. So you have to actually kind of know who you are and if can you handle, you know, um, they say entrepreneurs have high tolerance for anxiety just on a clinical basis. And uh, it certainly is, I've seen this in other times, but you know, sometimes this stuff is not, it's not for everybody, but if it does resonate for you, I think you can find a way. And one of the things I've always said is um, when you find people you admire, try to see if you can get them to care what happens to you. Because um, I think that's what you know, Michael was kind of saying in two, that you do, you have this, if you have that capacity um, at any level, it probably helps inform, you know, what you want to do and what you want to be. But it's it's always, you know, edifying for me. I just heard about a, you know, very highly educated um, corporate person who was, you know, fluent in Spanish, um, who just bagged the whole thing and is in Denver working at a, at a homeless shelter, with, you know, using her Spanish. And she's just happy. She's happy with the people. Michael in his chapter mentioned that when he went to work at Jamal Place, that he said the people were like saints. And you know, there's always going to be people who are uh, even more <laughs> morally advanced than you are. But it, it is, uh, it's, it's a powerful thing to be around, you know, people who, who, you know, who want to make change. But um, I guess because I, I did see people out there, I ran around with the autonomy opera right before it became the Red Brigade. Crazy. I was, I don't know what I was doing, taking risks like that when I was a Rolling Stone guy. But, um, you know, it's, there, there, there are levels at which changing society, um, you know, you're, you're going to, it's full time and it's, it's all in. Mm. Uh, it's, 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 it's interesting, but I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's certainly, you know, noble work. But I think as soon as you're looking to make it um, highly scaled, you know, with impact on a larger level, it's, it is hard. Yeah, that's where that meaning and purpose that Steve was mentioning comes into play as well. And and Mike, for you, what, what about for you? What what advice would you give people? What sort of um, encouragement might you give people? Yeah, you know, I think people, generally speaking, are motivated to try to get involved in 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 um, issues in public life because they're angry about something that they uh, that they see in the world that they want to change or something that's happened to them. And I, I think that um, anger um, can often lead you pretty paralyzed because um, it's just hard to know what to do with it if you're not someone who's gonna, you know, act out on it, right? Um, and so I would encourage people to take the thing that they want to change or that they want to see changed and see if there's someone who's doing it that they could help. Um, and that, can you know happen virtually? I think it really can happen also um, locally um, in a really um, effective way. It can be kind of scary to do that to go reach out to someone. So maybe like I'm trying to do with working out, like get a buddy, and bring <laughs> somebody with you. <laughs> um, but I I find that it will. Um, first of all, I agree. You'll end up. In the in that process, I think finding a lot of meaning, um, and 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 I, I also think that, you know, uh, this is going to make me sound like an Obama guy. Uh, I don't Shocking. I don't think the change that people want to see is going to come from the top down. Hmm. I, I just don't think it ever has. I I have seen I you know you said it um, earlier, Don, when you talked about the media. Um, large institutions follow, they don't lead. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so people, I think, have a lot more power in individual acts than, than they think they do, even in the middle of them. Um, and so I just say, go find someone in Glencoe 
who's doing the thing, who's look, there's somebody, I promise you, in Glencoe, or maybe I might have to go as far as Evanston, <laughs> who's, who's doing the thing that you care about that could really use your help. Um, and, uh, and that spirit of curiosity and wanting to be of service, I think um, you can find, make a lot of impact and, and, and feel a lot better about uh, the, uh, the world that you're living in. Mm. Thanks. I do have to add one quick thing because I've heard talk of saints and patients um, and I'm neither. Um, so <laughs> I, I would say anger can be fuel. Um, a lot of times it spurs us into action. And one of the things I had to learn more and I continue to try to learn and apply is to let anger be my, my fuel, but not my wheel, right? Let anger be my fuel and let hope be my wheel. Um, and I have to constantly remind myself of that. Um, and for all of these reasons is why I believe that a strong civil society is, you know, it's not going to come from government al alone. Government is part, business is part, we each are part. Um, so let's, you know, that's why I'm so delighted to have an opportunity to be working on voter participation. Um, and I believe that, you know, coming from Mexico and the reasons why we had to leave and seeing some of the things that are still going on over there, some people are seen in the headlines. I and as a and in and, and as a American by choice, I would say that we should embrace the fact that the United States is the greatest country in the world. And it's not because it's perfect, it's a work in progress, but there's an opportunity to work on that progress in many ways that are not possible in other countries. So let's embrace that, not because we're looking at it with rose-colored glasses, but because we see that there's agency and, and, and need for each one of us to pull whichever one of those levers that, um, that we may have to make sure that we make it better. Yeah, that's great. It's oh, interesting. Oh. I, I, so one of the other things is when you can find a piece of, of data or a piece of a reality that it is actually true and it has, un, as Michael said, unfairness to it. Um, if you're one of those people who likes to start things or, or, or drive with ideas, that can also be something that's very defining for how you think of things. So for all those things I've done, you know, to try to move, um, move forward, you know, things in, in in Newark, and there was an amazing comeback, and the quality of character, the, the content of character, and the people in Newark are just unbelievable. So, but I just heard, and it, now it's verified, that uh, one of nine children in Newark will lose a parent or a sibling by the time they're nine, they're eighteen years old, and the traumatic outcome of that um, leads to really terrible educational and and, and social and behavioral. You know, kind of outcomes, and it's uh, it so that we're we're now talking about other things, including some of the more sophisticated people when it comes to traumatic loss and making people feel part of communities in that environment. So, but it is another interesting way to to think about things. And when you're when you go into an environment that you want to serve, you also find that the stuff you read in the paper is often just not necessarily verifiably true. It's often rolling up in the same way that big institutions don't actually move stuff forward the way they did when they were founded, as Michaels was saying. You also find they're just simply not true. I've been unbelievably unhappy by the New York Times' recent discussions of, of, of childhood poverty. If you actually know what's going on in the urban court, particularly during COVID, um, it was good for the election, but you know, it's just not the case that the, the tax credits they talk about are actually even known to most of the people that live in the in the disenfranchised parts of the urban core. So, you know, that makes you mad. And then you go think of, you know, what's the counter narrative and what are you going to do about it? But I do think that you're right. It's, it definitely is 
is anger and it's also um, other things trauma my, my father died suddenly when i was 19 and i've uh, it's there's a lot of studies that fatherlessness creates relatively driven kind of people and uh i think even you know michael's longtime uh boss and colleague has talked about this from you know from his point of view so uh, uh you know there's a lot there's a lot of motivations to it but yeah and I, I, I do think uh, you know it's some sort of trauma rage trauma other things that does does push people into these kind of driven you know driven lives but that can be positive for others if you if you're success, success. Howard, I um one one takeaway from the book and I think it's been uh reinforced tonight uh beautifully by uh you know Don and Clarissa and Mike uh is the importance of storytelling uh to achieve uh, I mean, it's cathartic for a lot of people uh, just to be able to unburden themselves with their with their own stories but to uh make your point to be persuasive to effect change and i think just in you know in in hearing each of the the different stories of of don and clarissa and mike tonight you you see the 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 power and the inspiration that their individual stories and journeys have and and for these three people with the skill to be able to share those stories with others is really important in trying to reach the goals that you're trying to reach. Well, and I would add one thing to that without trying to blow too much smoke is being able to retell those stories is an incredibly important skill as well. So for those of us who known you and Stephen uh, and appreciate the work that you've done in telling not only this story of uh, the people on this pan this incredible panel here, but the other people in the book, as well as many others, I think it's, it's so critically important. So okay. um, if anybody has questions, uh, we're about to end. So uh, there have been no questions that have uh, been posted on the uh, in Q and A. So um, assuming that uh, continues to be the case, then I think what we'll do is say thank you guys because uh, for I know for me this has been an incredibly inspiring opportunity and uh, I appreciate all you taking the time and the effort that you put into all of this and, and the work that you're doing so so keep it up and thank you thank and, you uh, Grace turn it back over to you thank you thanks so much to um, our panelists for your your time and and your your work um, on behalf of the world and to our wonderful moderator Howard Rossman um, thank you so much for guiding the conversation and of course to St Steve Pfeiffer whose vision may well inspire others to seize their own moments and to uh, put their care and hope into action as Clarissa put it so well and I just want to say thank you so much everyone and um, we'll see you at the next one Stay bye -bye. Safe. thank you everyone bye everyone thank you bye-bye bye-bye